The Constitutional Revival Movement is well and active. Meet a founder of an organization that is fighting to return our country back to its lawful foundations. Next on Common Sense. Hello, I'm Mike Nixon. Welcome to Common Sense. This show is dedicated to the proposition that most of what you know is wrong. I recently had the opportunity to sit down with John Cutmeyer, who is the founder and fiduciary of Save a Patriot Fellowship, which is located in Westminster, Maryland. According to their website, Save a Patriot Fellowship is a national organization of concerned Americans. They have joined together to resist illegal actions of the Internal Revenue Service and other government agencies by preventing their misapplication of law. The fellowship does not advocate or condone unlawful resistance, protests, or other like actions. The fellowship strongly believes that everyone must file whatever returns the law requires them to file and pay any tax due for any liability as shown under the law in a timely and conscientious fashion. They do not condone the willful non-filing of required returns nor evasions of such taxes. The fellowship disseminates factual information about federal and state law as well as the Constitution of the United States and they do encourage the study of those laws and the assertion of one's rights in accordance with the law. The fellowship is not a tax protest organization. It is a First Amendment association dedicated to creating legal actions to require the government to obey the law. Let's meet John Cutmeyer now. John Cutmeyer, welcome to Common Sense. Oh, glad to be here, Mike. Um, I thought we'd maybe just start out talking about kind of who John Cutmeyer is. Um, where were you born? Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, when were you born? October the 6th, 1934. 1934. Right. Okay. So you soon be 73. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, what, what, was it, what was it like growing up? when you were a boy, uh, particularly in the context of I've seen, change. well, I was, I was born in the last part of the, the, what they called the Great Depression. And uh, I knew what it was because if we had a hole in our shoe, we put cardboard in the shoe. And, uh, you know, and a, and a penny was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, I guess in my lifetime, I've just watched our rights just dwindle away. I mean, you know, there was no zoning. People built what they wanted to build. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if they wanted to uh, build a house, start with the basement, live in the basement, then build it, it was no problem. They just did it because it was their property. And I've seen over the years this great change in our country, and it, it alarmed me from day one, I guess. In me, I've always had this feeling of justice and to be free and and people not to bother me if I don't bother them. Right. Where does that come so, from? I don't know. It just seems to be natural with me. You know, I took a lot of punches in the nose for, for interfering with the bully <laughs> mm -hmm. beating on somebody. And I always was that way. So my wife calls me the, the great crusader, you know. Mm -hmm. So I guess it just came natural. I, I really believe that uh, over the years I've grown to believe that I'm in mean, God's will, I think. Right. I I've think this, this, this is what he plans for me, and, and I've been cursed, but I have to do it. Or so blessed, do, as the case may be. Right. Yeah, more cursed than blessed, but a <laughs> blessing in the end, hopefully. Mm -hmm. well, so what was your educational process environment growing up? I mean, how did you learn a lot of the things as a, as a young man? 
that you well, have formed your character and all? My, my family uh, was very political in Baltimore. Uh, the, my, my grandfather ran the Stonewall Democratic Club in South Baltimore, and his brother ran the Shamrock Democratic Club in that's, Southwest Baltimore. That's Stonewall is in Stonewall Jackson? I, yes, <laughs> that's right. That's, that's yeah. true. And, uh, and both of them were on the police force at the same time. My grandfather was a lieutenant of detectives, and, and my, his brother, who I called Uncle Jake, he, he um, uh, was a mounted police. And coincidentally, at the same time, uh, they were uh, bootleggers. <laughs> they both had speakeasies. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it was an interesting period to grow up, you know, being a, uh, a young child. I'm sitting in my grandfather's house. Everybody went there on Sunday. The old families, they just, Sunday was going to my grandfather's. Mm-hmm. And they'd sit around and talk. And I was exposed to this. My uncle uh, Lou, he was a uh, city councilman. And I heard all this talk and I, the free talk about cronyism, you know, which was the, the rule of the day, I think, that. Looking back and my education I've gained over the years, cronyism actually was was one of the reasons to overthrow the, the, the British government, mm-hmm. number one. Number two, we got it back when we brought all the immigrants in at the late 1800s for the Industrial Revolution. Right. Because they didn't understand what was set up here, and they brought it right back from, from Europe mm-hmm. where we got away from. And uh, so that we were... My uh, great-great-grandfather came over during the war between the states, or northern aggression, whatever you right. want to say. And, war uh, for southern independence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, war for southern independence is good. So anyway, uh, you know, I had a, I just grew up with it, and um, grew up with listening to political deals and all this stuff, and mm-hmm. get this job, you know, and need this favor or that favor. Uh, when you when you got older, you were a police officer for a while, weren't you? Yes, I uh, I spent four years in naval aviation during Korea, and when I got out, I did a little bit of work as a carpenter, and, and then went on the police force. Mm-hmm. And yes, I was on the police force in, in Baltimore for about eight years. Did that give you a particular perspective about the law? Yeah, it gave me more of an insight uh, than what I had gained through my grandfather's living room. Uh, I was on for about a year when uh, a sergeant gave me a call to meet him under a Russell Street Vidoc in Baltimore on a Sunday. His Sundays were very calm days in those days. You know, you didn't have much to do. You get the Sunday paper and go park under a bridge and read it. Mm-hmm. And so I, I pulled up there and he got out of his car and came over and got in mine. And he was saying to me, he says, well, Cotton Myers, he's been on a year now and uh, I think you're an R.A. guy. It's about time you learn how things work. <laughs> and, then, and then he went on to tell me about uh, there's no problem with uh, organized crime in, in, in Baltimore and Maryland because it's, it's run by the police department. <laughs> <laughs> and the rackets are run by the police department, and the governor's involved. And uh, he even named little Willie Adams at that time. He was the, ran all the numbers and everything. And, and uh, he's telling me I ought to get my share, too. <laughs> and you know uh, the territory that you uh, cruise gets so much this is what you would get and, and I listened to that for about a half an hour or so and I said well can I ask you a question and he said uh, sure go ahead I said well sergeant I don't understand I said how do all these people expect to excel in a society they're destroying Mm-hmm. And he took a long moment, and he looked at me, and he says, you're a nut. <laughs> <laughs> he got out of the car and got in his and drove off from that time on. Uh, I was a nut among about four others in the station house. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of the way it was. Mm-hmm. And uh, it got so so that I couldn't uh, I couldn't stay. And, I mean, I always believed in justice, and, and it was just uh, a couple other things took the cake, you know. I, Remember one time I uh, uh, arrested this fellow on, on uh, a witness's testimony that he had stolen her purse. He was a black guy, and he and uh, she described him with a big silver dollar 
a scar on the back of his neck. And so I, I, I went down to the jumbo store where all the jitterbugs hang out. And then when I went in there and I saw this guy and I brought him out. And it's an old saying, I guess they all look alike, the people, unless you work them every day like I was doing. Right. And, uh, and she, she said, that's him. And so I took him through the preliminary hearing and, and uh, went up to the court. And he got the uh, time. And about 30 days later, I got information from one of my informants that I had the wrong guy. So I investigated and checked it out. And boy, I did have the wrong guy. Mm -hmm. So the next setting of the magistrate's court, I, I went in and I, uh, I told the magistrate, I, you know, I waited for the court and it was the last one. I just went up and talked to the judge. I said, I want to tell you I got to reopen the case because I got the, this wrong man. And he looked at me and he says, what are you, a crusader? <laughs> I, I said, how in the hell would you like to be sitting in that jail if you were innocent? Mm -hmm. You know? And I got a little loud and the captain came out and he said, uh, get out of there, cut Mark. And that was it. They just let the guy sit there. Said, really? Yeah, it's just callous. Yeah. I, I, I didn't, uh, another uh, time when uh, down on Camden Street, right around where Camden Yards is now, mm -hmm. There was a clothing manufacturer down there, made, manufactured men's suits. His name was Reuben, Max Reuben. And, when, and, and he had a great big hallway there. And the hallway must have been 12, 13 feet wide. And he had these uh, pipe racks, and he had maybe 100 or 200 or 150 suits hung on these pipe racks. Mm -hmm. And they were all along the hallway, and the trucks could back right up to the door <laughs> and just load them right into the trucks and mm -hmm. take them out. But well, one day this truck backed up to the door and he loaded a few racks of suits and drove off. And he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. So we got a call, you know, and Max found out that somebody stole a bunch of his suits. And we started <laughs> investigating. About 30 days later, I got this information that the guy who did it was working out in Pimlico Racetrack uh, as a, what they call him, these uh, some kind of groom, you know, mm -hmm. as a groom. And uh, so I put a, uh, got a, a warrant out for him, and, and uh, they picked him up out there and brought him down, and we went ahead and charged him. We had enough evidence to charge him. So the preliminary hearing was, and Max, Max Rubin came down for the hearing, and I'm in the courtroom, and I, I noticed in the back was the ward boss, Fats Garrett, his name was. He was... 25th Wardy, you know, he was the political ward boss. And so I, I, I'm looking there, I'm looking at the judge, you know, and, and finally the case comes up, and, and I, we had him dead to rights. I mean, I, it was irrefutable evidence. And uh, the judge says, well, I don't think that we have enough evidence to go up on, you know, up to the court and dismissed. <laughs> and I look back at Fat Scar standing in the back with a cigar. I said, put the cigar out in my you know, fats. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, when we're going out the door, the guy I arrested looked at me and he says, I got a good tip for you in the fifth. I just looked at him. He said, legal larceny, he bet it. <laughs> and out the door he went. And I mean, I was getting hot. And Max Rubin yeah. says, now let it go, boy, let it go. But you know, he just sat there a while. Right. And, yeah, and I, uh, you know, a few things like that where I just couldn't stay. What? Finally, they you know they even threatened my life one time. Really? Oh yeah. So I just got out of there. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, <clears throat> I know a few cops now, and uh, you know I think have integrity, but it seems to me that it's a hard system to work in. Well, you, if you have integrity. Yeah, you, 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 it is because you you go in there and it's like becoming a politician, right? You go in there with all good intentions, but everybody around you is, is, is taking this money, and mm -hmm. first thing you know, why you know can't do anything about it. Right. You might as may well, as well join, join them. them, right? That's why government's corrupt. Right, right. Okay, well, I'm sure we'll get back to that. Uh, the 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 other thing I like to just have you explore um, is. Um, your your whole your Christian values and your your upbringing as a Christian um, uh, how how did that well, I was, happen uh, and, and it wasn't really an upbringing uh, well I I was born my my family my my grandfather's pure German both sides 
My grandmother's pure Irish, both sides. Mm -hmm. And I was a fine young Catholic boy. Right. Went through Catholic school mm -hmm. and uh, altar boy the whole bit. And uh, around, uh, well, the Bay of Pigs invasion really set me off. Really? Yeah, because here I am, a, a ex vet, you know, from the Navy. And uh, here, when when they landed those Cubans on that beach, and and somehow it got a big mistake where they got the wrong ammunition for the weapons they had. I said, "Hey, come on, <laughs> this is not for real." Yeah. And I started digging ever since. And uh, remember the Knights of Columbus, the whole thing, you know. But anyway, I started digging around and looking, and it led me to uh, the, the communist movement. And uh, I used to go up to. Uh, the New Era Bookstore in Park Avenue in Baltimore, which is the communist bookstore. Mm -hmm. And I'd buy The Worker. At that time, he came out twice a, a, a month. So every other Tuesday, I'd go up there and pick a copy of The Worker up to see what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And this one uh, one Tuesday, I went up and I got The Worker and, and uh, come home and read it from cover to cover. And my, I had two boys going to St. Jerome's School, which is Scott and Hamburg, the same school I went to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the two of the priests there were, were there when I, I went to school there. They were young men. Mm -hmm. And one of them was Father McAvoy, who uh, I was an uh, altar boy for, and he was my basketball coach. And uh, he started giving the sermon, and, and, and uh, I thought I was reading the worker again. I couldn't believe it. It was almost word for word what was really? proposed in the worker. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't contain myself, so I stood up and I said, what the <laughs> hell are you doing to these people? <laughs> you know? And the uh, man, he says, get that man out of here. And the ushers came. And really? Said, yeah, man, they were trying to get me out of there, and I'm way shaking my fist at him. <laughs> and I guess the people thought I was nuts. Right. They didn't have my, my wife was saying, shut up, John, you know, and <laughs> pulling on me. And they, they uh, my my, the t my picture was on the, the the pastor's mantle. That's how tight our family was, mm -hmm. you know. And there goes they were political, right? And and uh, he called up my mother and father and said, "Goldwater's done that to that boy. The Goldwater's <laughs> destroyed his brain." Mm -hmm. And uh, they kicked my 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 two boys out of, out of the school. Really. Yeah. Just for your challenging the priest in uh, the middle of the service. Oh, yeah. They, yeah. You know, they were out of the school. We had, and it was like the end of the year. We had about a month ago. We had to put them in a public school. Mm -hmm. And my mother and my father called me a Nazi. <laughs> and I said, Pop, how can I be a Nazi when I'm green with the founding fathers? Right. You know? And they didn't talk to me for two years. Really? <laughs> two years. And, and there was, uh, and then I met this uh, guy by the name of Dave Madison, who was a, uh, coordinator for the John Birch Society, you know, mm -hmm. and he started witnessing to me, mm -hmm. and uh, first thing you know, uh, you know, I said, yeah, and I, and I, and I gave my, my uh, self to Christ. Uh, mm -hmm. My wife did, and we were baptized, and, and so, children grew I mean, that, that, that path had a lot more meaning for you than the kind of... Oh, yeah, I, I could, I, I could see what was going on, it coincided right. with, the, with the Bible, you know, and, even more so today. Right. Even and that was so in the today. 60s? That was around 64, 60. And, and the evangelical movement kind of really, I, I think, there was a lot of things going on oh, yeah, politically. The, yeah, the, the Christian that. school movement started mm -hmm. then, and, uh, and there wasn't any around where we were. But, uh, yeah, it was everything was like in its infancy, you know, with Goldwater. And all. Right, right. Right. Yeah, you, uh, <clears throat> well, I guess that... Uh, so you started getting more political during during that period? Cause oh, yeah, yeah. I became political. I became a uh, uh, section leader in the John Birch, chapter leader and mm -hmm. section leader in the John Birch Society. And then uh, and being a young man, I uh, young young men seemed to turn to uh, fast solutions. Right. And, and I uh, got involved with what was called the Minute Man. Which was uh, the uh, Robert D. Pugh from Durban, Missouri. I remember started, them. Yeah. And started the Minuteman, and then 
Then I got involved with Alpha 66, which is the, the, the Cubans anti-communist, uh, anti-Castro. Mm-hmm. And uh, the uh, one thing led to the other, and then the Birch Society kicked me out because of my involvement with Alpha 66 and the Minutemen. Mm-hmm. And uh, so anyway, uh, we had this uh, a farm out in Carroll County, out here in Carroll County, and the, I guess my neighbors must have thought that something was wrong with us because the Cubans would come out and train on our farm and have all these <laughs> automatic weapons. <laughs> and after a year or so, uh, this this car pulls into the driveway, and I go, look at it, it's kind of a plain car, you know. And this guy gets out with his suit and a little string, stringy bin, a, a brimmed hat, and he comes walking down the sidewalk, and I walk up to meet him and I said, yes, sir, he says, uh, Mr. Cutmore, he says, I'm agent so-and-so from the FBI, and I've been told to come out and give you, just talk to you a little bit. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, well, you know, why do you want to talk to me? You ought to be talking to all these commies, and I can point them out for you, you know. <laughs> you should be with me, right. not talking to me. And uh, he kind of got to laughing, and I said, you know, you know, you don't have to worry about me because I'm, I'm really a nonviolent person. I believe in the, the rule of law. And about that time, my youngest son came out of the house with a garrison belt on the machete, with a helmet, and he, you know, he just looked and laughed. <laughs> but we had a few more words, and then he got up and went and left in his car. Mm-hmm. And I, I, land, I found out later on that I was part of the Cointel Pro uh, investigation. What was Cointel Pro? It was the counterintelligence between the F- FBI, IRS, and, and Army intelligence, and they were spying on Americans. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the uh, discovery and exposure of Cointel Pro is what brought the Privacy Act and the Freedom of Information Act. Mm-hmm. They were passed by Congress because. You could see what the government was doing to you, and it was—it was supposed to have been done away with the Spain. Right. So they weren't only well, spying on Martin Luther King and John Lennon; they were spying on, uh, you know, average, well, very much average citizens. Well, them and us too. Right, <laughs> right, right. right. Yeah, they, yeah, they were spying on everybody. Yeah. So, how did you uh, come to get involved in the um, constitutional re- revival? Movement. Well, I'm going to have to learn that phrase, John. The yeah, Constitutionalist Revivalist right. Movement. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, the whole time I, I would meet people and, and uh, you know, being involved in all these different uh, organizations and everything, you, you meet people of like thinking. And I remember some of the older gentlemen, I was the, like the young Turk then, you know, and some right. guys were in their 60s and 70s, they would, we would talk, you know, and he, I remember a couple of them who were contractors in, in down in Catonsville, and they said to me, John, they said, the Constitution is everything. The Constitution is where it is, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, nobody pays any attention to the Constitution, which with these guys, you know. <laughs> but the nuts. Guy, yeah, right? the nuts. You know, I took an oath to support and defend it twice, once in the Navy and once in the, didn't even know what it was about. Right. Like most police do. Or, right. Politicians, even the president, I don't know. And uh, so, any which way, uh, as time went on, I just started to to see. And who really turned me on to it was a guy by the name of A.J. Porth. And that was about 1968. And A.J. Porth uh, refused to file a, a 1040 tax return because it would violate his Fifth Amendment rights. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was arrested, and and he had a hearing. And the hearing was a sanity hearing. And the judge put him in a mental institution <laughs> until he until he said that he would recant and and, and not talk about that. And uh, his wife begged him to get out. He was a a building contractor in, in uh, Kansas. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, when I read about this in the uh, a monthly newsletter called the Washington Observer, and the hair went up on the back of my neck. And I started looking around and contacted him and people like him, a guy by the name of Vaughn Ellsworth, they're both deceased now, mm-hmm. they were older than me. And uh, at that time I was a building contractor, uh, or called Free State Home Builders. 
And uh, <clears throat> so I got to meet these guys. I went to, a, in 73, I went to a um, tea party over in Washington, D.C., and we all went out and dumped through tea bags into the Potomac, you know, and, mm-hmm. and got to uh, delving into the Constitution. And I had j- just enough knowledge about the tax and the Constitution related to it to get myself in trouble, which I did. Right, which a great many <clears throat> in in this area do. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, a little bit of knowledge is dangerous, right. they say, and that's true. Right. And uh, I wound up doing uh, two years in a federal prison camp. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of feel like I had a well-rounded life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've done, done a lot of things, and, and uh, putting people in jail, they got put in jail myself. It, mm-hmm. was, it was an interesting uh, part of my life. But anyway, when I went to the uh, prison camp, I found out that uh, things were, were well known within uh, the, the federal employees. Like the, I was there two days when the captain of the camp called me up to his office. And I went in and he says, uh, cut my heart, he says, I know you're a political prisoner. I know what your background is. And he said, this is my secretary is going to be getting out in a month. And I'd like you to consider to take his place. And I got to thinking about that, and I said, well, Captain, uh, I appreciate the offer, but being an ex-police officer, I said, uh, I think I'll pass it up because some of these guys might think I'm a snitch, (laughs) (laughs) you know, and I don't feel like going through all that. So he says, okay, but I I appreciate your honesty. I said, I appreciate yours, too. And... uh, so anyway, a couple of days later, I get a call over to the, the recreation shack to a guy, a black guy over there by the name of Charlie Hudson, who I've grown to really love, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, Charlie was a Georgia cracker. And when I got over there, he, he, he called me into his office and shut and locked the door. And he said, I'm not going to let you out until you tell me everything you know. <laughs> <laughs> so Charlie and I became great friends. And he even set up part of the recreation in the camp that I would lecture on the taxes and the Constitution. Really? Well, I was there, so every, uh, I think it was Thursday, if I remember correctly, we would every Thursday evening, we had a captured audience, a captive audience. Literally, yeah. Yeah, literally. (laughs) And we would lecture on the Constitution and taxes. So no time is is wasted, really. Right, right. And uh, it was interesting. I did... uh, Maxed out a two-year sentence, which was 17 months and five days. Mm-hmm. And then they uh, would come home. And I was, uh, well, when I got home, I had to report in to the uh, 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 parole officer. Mm-hmm. And the uh, <clears throat> his name was Van Scoy. I never forget him. It was down in the federal building of Baltimore in the, in the courthouse. And I went in there, and he says, uh, what I did, I, I gained uh, 23 days, which I had to do as, as if on parole, because they only get so much time, good time, and, and so much time, camp time, for working. And you can only accumulate 180 free and clear. So I was 23 days over. Mm-hmm. That's why I had to report into him. And uh, he said, he come there, he says, well, come on, let me tell you, he says, uh, uh, because, you know, I had a month of trial. It was in the media all the time, tax protest leader, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it was, a, it was a big splash in Baltimore. And uh, he says to me, uh, well, Cutmar, he says, you've got 23 days to do. You don't have to report in or anything. He says, just go home, reunite yourself with your wife. Stay off the radio shows. Stay out of the, you know, the newspapers <laughs> for twenty-three days. For twenty-three days, yeah. and you can do what you want. Right. And uh, what I, what I used to do when when I, when I was uh, before I was convicted, what I used to do is I take a, a ten forty and I put the Fifth Amendment on there, right? Right. And then I I, <laughs> I, I made up cut my reserve notes, <laughs> and I was paying them with cut my reserve uh-huh. notes, uh, telling them that they're. Uh, my green stamps are as good as your green stamps. They're both backed up by bona fide poppycock, you know. Mm. And uh, during the trial, they made a billboard out of my cut my reserve notes. <laughs> <laughs> and then for the jury to see, they really liked that. Every day they was set up on a mm-hmm. easel, you know. And uh, so anyway, he says, all right, <clears throat> that's all. 
So I started out the door, and he says, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, yeah, he says, uh, what about this $10,000 fine? I said, ten thousand dollar fine. He says, Yeah. I said, Well, what do you want it? Got my reserve notes. <laughs> <laughs> he says, Get out of here. <laughs> and that was the end of that. They, so you never paid the fine? No. They. Uh, oh, I guess it was uh, four or five years later. I get a letter from the U.S. Attorney's Office in Baltimore, you know, telling me that I owe ten thousand. So <clears throat> I wrote back and told him that. Uh, I'm not gainfully uh, uh, employed. So anyway, uh, the following year, they sent me out an application for a credit card <laughs> <laughs> and with, a, with a, uh, a financial statement, you know. So I, I, I told them, you crazy thing, I'm going to fill out a financial statement, right. and I don't want your credit card either. So I sent that back to them, and they... What, the Fed sent you a credit card? Yeah, the U.S. Offered? Attorney, Baltimore. And then, uh, oh, they did that for a couple of years, and then, oh, uh, ten years later, maybe eleven years later, they, uh, the U.S. Attorney sent me a letter uh, saying that they uh, they're lifting the lien, mm-hmm. and it's no longer owed. Right, right. right? <laughs> I, 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 just to trace back a second, I just find it interesting that uh, someone on parole can have their uh, free speech rights. So restricted. Well, it's only 20, yeah, I mean, well but it's oh, yeah. 23 days, but it could be two years. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, well, it's, it's gotten worse. Right, maybe. yeah. Oh, yeah, it's gotten worse. So. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, well, the month went by. I got out in uh, January, and one month later in February, I started the fellowship. That's what I was going to get to. This it's really started you on the path to... Uh, Creating right. the fellowship where you know where we're recording this. Oh yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, you know the month of trial. Uh, when the when the judge uh, sentenced me, you know, I mean the trial. You wouldn't believe the trial. Uh, when the jury was supposed to go out to deliberate, mm-hmm. I'm standing there waiting for it to start. You know, at the table and. The stranger came up to me and he said, "Mr. Cutmar," I said, "Yes, sir." He says. Uh, you don't know me, he says, but I have evidence that your jury's rigged against you. I thought, this is, you know, is this Hollywood? <laughs> <laughs> right. right. And uh, I said, uh, yeah, he says, that's, that's correct. I said, wait a minute. So I grabbed my attorney, Arthur Tanakis, from, from Atlanta. I said, Arthur. And he told Arthur, you know. Arthur's eyebrows go up, and he walks over to the U.S. attorney and tells him. And the U.S. attorney says, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> Again, <laughs> you know, and uh, so he calls the clerk over. The clerk goes back to the judge in his chambers, and we're all called back into the judge's chambers with a stenographer. So we go in there, and, and the fellow who come to me, they put him under oath. Mm-hmm. And the stenographer's taking all this, right? And uh, uh, he tells him that he has a place of business. And one month before my trial was to start, the the woman who was the jury foreman on my trial in my trial came and, and his place of business was bragging about how she was going to convict me. Right. Mm-hmm. So Arthur removed the judge for an acquittal, and the judge denied the motion. Mm-hmm. Then Arthur moved the judge for um, um, the right to investigate the jury. Mm-hmm. And the judge denied that and ordered that we were never to investigate the jury. And the trial went on. We went out there to the table, and Arthur says, I, I can't believe this. I said, Arthur, what's wrong with you? They've had a month of trial. Do mm-hmm. you think they're going to waste all that money and then let us walk out and beat them to mm-hmm. the public? I said, I have to go to jail. I knew that before I even started. You know, Arthur thought he was going to win that. I told him from day one he wasn't going to win. Well, I have a month of trial for two misdemeanors. And uh, and the, the point of doing it in the judge's chambers is they could keep it quiet as opposed to oh, doing sure. it in the oh, public sure. courtroom. You, well, you don't yeah. have it. You know, it's not in the open courtroom now. Right. I mean, that would really blow sky high in open courtroom. Right. 
And uh, well, it all comes back to secrecy is uh, <clears throat> is a great tool of the state. It's still there. It's yeah, worse now than right. then. Believe me. Right. I mean, uh, you wouldn't believe some of it. I, in 1973, uh, no, it was 76. They were trying to get third-party records from my subcontractors, and uh, there's a 70, a 70, uh, 7609 of the code allows the, 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 the interested party to intervene in the action. And I intervened in the action of AJ, A&J Electric was my electric contractors and they tried to get their records. And the, the, the judge at that time was the same judge who presided over my trial. His name was Jim Miller. So I asked him for permission to uh, brief brief it and he gave me till the day of the trial, the day of the hearing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I took in a brief in, in there and I, in the brief was citing all these Supreme Court cases saying that the 16th Amendment didn't change the Constitution and mm -hmm. all this, you know. And I had it all briefed. And uh, so I, I go in there and I gave it to the clerk before it was supposed to start. Mm -hmm. And the clerk took it back into the judge's chambers. And he was three hours late coming out. I knew what he was doing. He was back there checking all your citations. All, these, all the citations. Right. They have a little library back there. Mm -hmm. And finally, when he came out, all rise, we all rise, you know. And, but he didn't sit down. He put his hands on, on, on the bench like that. And he looked over at me. He took one hand. He pointed at me and he said, Let me tell you something, Cutmar. He said, It's been a long time ago since those cases. We've been doing it this way all these years, and we're not going to stop now. There's been a lot of water under the bridge. And that was it. I busted out laughing, and, and, and Joe Fellner, who was an electrical contractor, he turned to me and he says, what are you laughing for? He's rolling against you. Mm -hmm. I said, Joe, don't you understand? He just admitted that I'm right. Their right. days are numbered. Right. Of course, I was wrong because they're dead. <laughs> Mark Lane using it. Uh, uh, well, it was just a bigger number than you anticipated, right? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 uh, well, it's, it's coming out more and more. Right. Yeah. More people are starting to understand. Yeah, but wh yeah. while you're saying that, and I don't want to get off on a, a too big a tangent here, but like um, withholding mm -hmm. only came about during World War II, which was right. only like 25 years before this. I mean, oh, yeah. that hadn't been in place. It wasn't like it had been in place for 50, 60 years. Oh, that's right. And these things get established as long-term history pretty quick. <laughs> well, they, they become, you know, a, a practice. Right. Not law, just a practice. Right. But I, I mean, I remember in school, because I graduated from high school in 67, right. and I remember during the 60s, they didn't teach anything remotely like recent history. You know, they stopped at World War II. And, and you know, it's no wonder we have such an ignorant society oh, yeah. uh, because our educate, so-called educational mm -hmm. system doesn't expose us to anything relevant. They certainly don't teach the Constitution no. in schools. Oh, no. No. Uh, law schools, they only get four hours of it. Yeah. <laughs> what can you teach somebody in four hours? Right. They, they don't know. Yeah. I've had, you know, I've had judges that, uh, I had a judge tell me one time, it's a Maryland State judge. Uh, they... They, they ruled against me in, in a case with the state and state controller. It was a civil case. And it, and it made the um, uh, the Baltimore Sun. It was the front page of the Baltimore Sun. Mm. Uh, April the 2nd, 1980. And uh, they, uh, they're quoted as saying in the Sun paper, in quotes, if we had ruled for Cutmar, we would have just destroyed the taxing structure in the state of Maryland. Mm. Right? And uh, that same judge, it was about a month or so later, a uh, short period of time, I happened to be in the cafeteria at the courthouse, and he came in and saw me. And he walked over to, to the table, and he says, Cotmar, he says, look, we know you're right. He said, but if, if we would do what you say, we would destroy the fi financial structure of this country. I'm at the Federal Reserve, you know. mm -hmm. and I, I said, no, Judge, you wouldn't destroy it. There would be a correction, but after that correction, we would have prosperity. Right. And he says, 
Well, we can't go through that. We got to we got to uh, protect the system that we have, and that's their attitude. Right. I mean, you know, look, look. To it. You even have the same attitude today. In fact, Ron Paul is saying that. You know, mm-hmm. he's saying it's not uh, a politically pl- popular to to, to uh, uh, do away with with inflation. Right. I mean, nobody wants, well, wants the crash to come. There's too many powerful direction. people who are, I mean, who are dependent upon the system. Of course. The bankers, right? <laughs> right? right. The politicians, the bureaucrats. Right. But it also, like like he just said, he, he was just doing uh, uh, CNBC mm-hmm. and uh, on, on the Wall Street Report. And he said on there, he says, you know, it's better to do it now if it keeps on going. You, you, how are you going to recover from such a crash? Personally, I think he's an optimist. I don't say we can recover from the, from the crash now. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we have no manufacturing to recover with. Right, yeah. You have to have manufacturing. You've got to produce something of, of, of wealth to recover. I mean, maybe, yeah, Perot was right about a number on us. I was going to say, Perot was right about one thing that sucking sound has only gotten louder. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, well, we started to talk a little bit about the fellowship. How, yeah. how did you come about? How did the fellowship come about? In the being? idea for yeah. the fellowship. Right. Well, I've no, I've noticed uh, uh, a lot of um, we would the movement would attract a lot of young people. Uh, 30s, you know, mm-hmm. and they had families and what have you, and they would take the hit, go to jail, and, and they couldn't afford it. They couldn't have that their, their family be on the street, you know, the children, because you know how people are, they're mortgaged to the hill. Right. And um, and while I was in the prison camp, we had two or three of them who capitulated and, and, and took parole because they had to go home to, to help their family. Right. And I could understand that, you know. You know, soldiers were going home from the Revolutionary War because they needed to help their family. Right. And you know, if we're freed in a family, a guy, family, and country, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so anyway, I just came up with the thinking about it and thinking about well, no, no army, and I think I of ourselves as a nonviolent political army, can exist without logistics. We have to have the. We got to support. We got to have to have support. So I came up with the idea of uh, the fellowship, where we get members and and we assess to the membership the loss so the family can be supported, either civilly or or, or criminally. Right. Kind of like yeah. an insurance program where you you pool the risk. Yeah, insurance yeah. right. insurance like, but right. not insurance. Right. 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 And I came up with that idea, and I can recall uh, one of the one of the patriots, I had to bounce it off somebody, you know. I was talking to my wife and I said, uh, I used to call her up like uh, once a week and we talked for an hour on the phone and uh, God bless her, you know, she had a bad time on those couple of years. But anyway, I was talking to her and trying to explain it to her and it's pretty hard because they listen over the phone, you know, mm-hmm. the guards do. And uh, I, I told her, I, I said, I'm, I think I'm going to call the organization SAP. Not the, not because we're a bunch of SAP. We can SAP the IRS if they can't help earn us, mm-hmm. right? Okay. And uh, uh, say they patriot SAP. And and so uh, this one patriot, I, I confided in him, and I told him about my idea. And he just looked at me kind of funny, and uh, he left. And two days later, he come back and said, man. You know, that's a great idea. <laughs> mm-hmm. We got to do that. So when I got out, I started it. And it's been ever since, except now they're trying to shut it down. Right. Well, they've Unlawfully. They've right. been trying to shut it down for a, a long time. Uh, oh, they? yeah. They, they, didn't, from, <clears throat> they watched us from day one, you know. And, uh, uh, yeah, they, uh, the church across the street, the Lutheran church, they got that preacher to allow them to set up cameras and all over there, and they were running the video of everybody coming in and out of the building. Really? And, yeah, and they who worked here, and they had a list. And, oh, so we might be on federal TV as we came in the building here? <laughs> I don't think they do that yeah, anymore. They right. don't have to, you right. know. Right. Right. But then they were trying to find something to, to uh, shut us down, and they raided us. And, of course... 
uh, July of, of 93, we were told by a, a, an IRS employee that we were going to be raided. You know, had a Patriot uh, mm-hmm. employee there, and he got word to us we were going to be raided. Mm-hmm. So I wrote a letter to the commissioner, and, 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 and I, uh, her name was uh, Richardson at that time. And I told her, I said, you know, we're, this is what we're doing here, and, and uh, we don't want to be breaking the law. Uh, if you would, uh, you know, look this over and, and, and show us what we're doing wrong, we would correct it. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. And, uh, in fact, uh, if you want, you can have an IRS agent right in our office as a liaison. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Right. And uh, she never answered, so I wrote another follow-up letter. And then uh, I got a reply from the head of the Criminal Investigation Division, IRS in Washington, D.C., saying the commissioner doesn't want to meet with me, she'll never meet with me, and the matter's turned over to a CID in Baltimore. And I said, well, that's no way to be, is it? You know, <laughs> that's not proper or friendly, is it? No. So anyway, uh, I thought, well, they're going to come in. So we backed up all our paper files. You know, as we were doing uh, paralegal work for, for our members, and we were mm-hmm. doing case work with, for our members, and we had all these files. So we copied all the files, and we had our membership list off uh, premises, and uh, we had it on a disk, and every day we were coming in, and it would be loaded in, 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 into, to, what do they call it, ROM? Um, floppy disk, yeah, probably. Yeah, it would stay right there, yeah. and it wouldn't go into the hard drive. Right. And every night it would come out, so if... Because this was 93, so this is this early in the computer revolution. That's right. So uh, we, the, the uh, receptionist was told if, if they come through the front door, you're going to take it out and crush it. <laughs> right? Because we had it backed up off premise. Right. And uh, so on, on December the uh, 10th of 93... Uh, I had a small safe in the house, and in it I had 45000 of, of, of money belonging to the fellowship. You know? mm-hmm. We didn't want to leave it here, right? particularly knowing they are going to raid us. And uh, so I remember my, my son was doing some remodel work in the house, and uh, it, was, it was pretty messy. And, and my wife had a throw over top of it. It looked like, it looked like a little round table mm-hmm. sitting there, and the furniture just moved away from the wall. You know how it is. Right. And uh, so that, that morning on December the 10th, I got up and I told him about three days before I wanted that safe out of there. And I said to him, I said, look, I want that out of here today. I'm leaving. I, I'm left to go to the office. When I come out, unbeknownst to me, they were in their woods with camouflage all over, about 25 of them. And uh, I went out and got in the car and, and couldn't see them. You know, I just drove off. And when I got halfway between the office, which is eight miles in, in uh, uh, my house. Then they hit the house and hit the office, 25 here and 25 there. Really? Yeah, they came They they came through my, my door at the house. My wife was in her negligee, and they had a ram. They just busted the door right through and put a shotgun in her face and then grabbed her by the arm and threw her in a chair. And they, my son was laying on the sofa, and they put a shotgun in his face and told him he better not get up. And all she could think of, that wasn't long after Waco. Right. And she thought, I'm just going to not say anything because I don't know if they kill me or not. Right. You know, she suffered from hypertension. I was a little worried when I found out. Mm-hmm. I got over here, they wouldn't let me in. And uh, <clears throat> they were in here grabbing everything. And the, and the disc with all the membership was on, was on, en route. And all mm-hmm. I can think about, man, we got to stop before he comes up here and tries to get in that office with that disc on him. Mm-hmm. And we intercepted him over in Railroad Avenue, <laughs> and he turned around and left with the disc. Mm-hmm. So they never got the membership list. And they uh, took them all day. They were, they, they, they were hit here like 8.30 in the morning. And of course, they had they told the news media about it, so all the TV cameras were here and all mm-hmm. that. And uh, they got out of here. They left at, at six in the evening, and they they carried out all our computers. They carried everything they could carry out. They carried out and all, all, all our filing cabinets. They put um, duct tape around them so the drawers, them, and they carried all the. The only thing they didn't take uh, was the copy machine because it was very you know it weighed a lot of. Right. Big copy machine. Right. 
So they didn't take anything in there. They didn't take the printing press because that weighed a lot too. <laughs> but anyway, uh, <clears throat> we filed an action in court for return of property. And uh, then we got the, the affidavit of probable cause. And that, that was ridiculous. You know, the, the, their probable cause was absurd. People come and go, and there might be on, on the premise uh, evidence of violation of tax laws. This is their probable cause. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and they had a criminal investigation of me. And uh, so anyway, we removed for the return of property. And uh, after about uh, five or six hearings, uh, we were making real. Well, it was evident that that the agents didn't know the law. And when I when I cross examined them on the stand, it was it was, it was laughable. <laughs> you know, it really was. And the U.S. attorney was watching this, and finally, after about five or six, he came over and said, "Look, Cutmore, I'm declining the criminal investigation. I don't want to go to court with you." Yeah, I guess he was afraid in front of the jury mm -hmm. how bad it would be. Really? So they dropped the charges? So they dropped, they dropped that, but they continued on. The, there was a civil side, which was uh, they said that we couldn't exist without being regulated by government. Mm -hmm. So that, that went on. And uh, so finally we had, we had a hearing on it, and uh, about a, almost a year later, uh, the judge ruled in our favor. And right, and said, this is an important point because we want to talk about the radio station later. Yeah, uh, right. But this established a very important precedent for you. Yeah. Oh yeah, we're the only organization that ever got a ruling that said we can't, you know, we can exist without being regulated by government. That mm -hmm. means that we don't have to keep uh, records or or anything, and they can't force us to. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, he also ruled they they were contending, and I I was doing business to save a patriot, and he ruled that's not so. It's a fellowship. It has officers, people do functions, and, and, and it's just not cut mark. Mm -hmm. You know how the money's taken care of and everything is not cut right. mark. Because it never was from the day one, it wasn't cut mark. Right. It was to serve the purpose that, uh, that we wanted it to serve. It's all about the, the Constitution. The constitutional revivalist right. movement. Right. You know, I told the judge uh, when they sentenced me, I told him, when I come out, I'm coming out ten times worse. <laughs> you know, I promise you that. <laughs> Bill told me that once, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and, and I meant it. And, I, you know, I meant what I said. Right. Uh, I, I, I told uh, this judge, he ruled in favor of us. I said, let me tell you something. I've dedicated the rest of my life to exposing this fraud. It needs exposing. Right. Well, and along those lines, too, because um, we re recently worked with you to help put this on the Internet, but mm -hmm. you did, uh, I mean, you do a, a number of educational things, uh, but you did a training program here in this room uh, years ago, which you put on video uh, that, that is a very in-depth primer on, uh, you know, the nature of the income tax and some of the truth. Oh, yeah, and so we, we call it just the facts because all we do is show the law. Right. Showing that the law, the, the law says that the average citizen doesn't know any tax, income tax that is, uh, except on any foreign earned income. Right. I mean, it's right in the law. Right. You can't, you can't ignore it or, yeah. or refute it. And and this program is available from the fellowship. Uh, it also can be viewed. We'll put a link up. Uh, uh, can be viewed on the internet uh, if you want to sit uh, there. On Twelve a, hours. <laughs> Twelve hours on a, on a uh, computer screen, yeah, yeah. but it is available. It, well, it, it, it really is a. Uh, uh, too long, uh, but the point of making it was to show that no matter where you looked or how you looked, you come to the same conclusion. So right. I took every phase of the Internal Revenue Code, the manual, the regulations, the, the delegation orders. Every thread you pull leads to the same place. It leads to the same thing. They're, they're, they're computer files. Mm -hmm. That concludes the first part of this two-part interview. Join us next week for part two. For Common Sense, I'm Mike Nixon, Sixth Semper Terranus. Uh, we, we plan on doing it with associate memberships of 99 a year for the, for the associate member. And uh, any organization who wants to join in, such as um, uh, Right to Bear Arms or the Jews for the Preservation, of any other organization like that has a mailing list, who wants to join in and get they would get their own show hmm. right 
mm -hmm. and free of cost, no charge. And just all they got to do is promote it to their membership because mm -hmm. through such uh, uh, methods, we can get enough members to make it a reality. Right. If we, if we get 100,000 members, we're off and running. Mm -hmm. we're, we're spreading this from here, there, and all over the place. So uh, anybody out there, you know, uh, jail for judges. Right. They, they claim they have uh, 40,000 uh, email addresses. Mm -hmm. They can have their own show. You know, and I, you know, I want people to know this. And even the local gun clubs or whatever, of course, they... We couldn't have too many gun clubs. There's only so much air time. Right, right. But they, they could select one, you know, that uh, they would represent them or whatever and talk about Second Amendment or anything. I was on for about a year when uh, a sergeant gave me a call to meet him under a Russell Street Vidoc in Baltimore on a Sunday. His Sundays were very calm days in those days. You know, you didn't have much to do. You get the Sunday paper and go park under a bridge and read it. Mm hmm and so I, I pulled up there, and he got out of his car and got over and got in mine. And he was saying to me, he said, well, Cut Mars has been on a year now, and uh, I think you're an R8 guy. It's about time you learn how things work. And he went on to tell me about uh, there's no problem with the organized crime in, in, in Baltimore or in Maryland because it's, it's run by the police department. The governor's involved, and uh, he even named Little Willie Adams at that time. He was the ran all the numbers and everything, and, and uh, he's telling me I ought to get my share, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, he, you know, uh, the territory that you uh, cruise gets so much, this is what you would get. And, and I listened to that for about a half an hour or so, and I said, well, can I ask you a question? <laughs> and he said, uh, sure, go ahead. I said, well, Sergeant, I don't understand. I said, how do all these people expect to excel in a society they're destroying. Mm -hmm. And he took a long moment and he looked at me and he says, you're a nut. <laughs> <laughs> he got out of the car and got in his and drove off from that time on. And I was a nut among about four others in the station house. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of the way it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, it got so so that I couldn't, uh, I couldn't stay. I, I mean, I always believed in justice. And, Sucks. Everyone chill out and we'll be fine. Is everything put away? Most avoidable police searches occur not because police have probable cause, but because most people, like Daryl, get tricked or intimidated into consenting to search requests. Now let's repeat what could be the three most important lines you may ever have to deliver in your entire life. Officer, I do not consent to any searches. Officer, am I free to go? Officer, I have nothing to say until I speak with my lawyer. If you've been paying close attention throughout this video, you're now a more intelligent citizen and are more prepared to protect yourself and assert your constitutional rights during police encounters.